In December, world leaders will gather in Morocco to sign the UN Global Compact on Migration. It's an agreement that will see countries hand over the ability to set their own immigration laws to the United Nations. It also contains many other worrisome proposals, so I sat down with Janice Atkinson MEP to discuss the agreement and to find out more about her experiences dealing with the European migrant crisis. I thought it'd be good today to talk about a couple of things. Migration, which I know you're an expert on these days, uh, and also the UN Global Compact for Migration, which is going to be signed by many countries, including Britain, mm -hmm. on the 10th and 11th of December. 10th and 11th of December in Marrakesh. Marrakesh. Not to be confused with the Marrakesh Agreement, which was signed earlier this year, which was an EU-African migrant compact. Right. This is now a UN compact. And it's done with deliberate obfuscation, so you get confused. So the, the Marrakesh agreement, that, that's already been signed? Signed, uh, signed and sealed between the EU and the African Union right. countries. And so that's facilitating an influx of migrants or refugees mm -hmm. from, from Africa, right? Yep. So now we move on to the UN Global Compact, which is causing a stir. A lot of people have said they're not going to sign it, the United States being one of them. Croatia said they wouldn't, but interestingly, they're sending their interior minister over he says that some of their red lines have been met or something, so maybe Croatia might even sign it at this point. But we've we got see. Slovakia, Israel, yeah. Australia. Uh -huh. um, Italy is having an internal discussion. I would think that uh, my good friend Matteo Silvini would not want to sign it, but I think probably the Five Star will, so that'd right. be an interesting one to watch. Yeah. Poland has said no, Austria, Hungary. And who knows what Mrs May thinks? There is a page on the website of the Home Office, Foreign Office, but we don't know what she thinks about it because the mainstream not media said anything about it. No, and the mainstream media are refusing to discuss it because they're just caught up with like, rabbits in the headlines uh, headlights with the um, with Brexit shambles. Well of course and actually the, the only reason this came to my attention really amidst I, I to be honest I was focused on Brexit as well is because I saw you posting about it. I've not seen any of this in the press. And I think the reason they don't talk about it is because I've been looking through it and it's terrible. It's one of the worst things I've ever seen. What, what drives me mad about it, they talk about um, data-led and evidence-led and this, that, the, there's no data in this. There's no data. And basically, what, let, let's just go over what it says for the viewers. It says, this global compact expresses our collective commitment to improving cooperation on international migration. Migration has been part of the human experience throughout history, and we recognize that it is a source of prosperity, innovation, and sustainable development in our globalized world. So effectively what they're doing here is they're making the presumption that all migration is good, which mm -hmm. is of course not true. Mm -hmm. um, migration has been part of the human experience throughout history. Well, aren't we often told that the migration of us into the, the you know, our colonial world was terrible, but no, that's human experience, yeah. right? Middle East. Well, of course. 2,000 years ago and now. No data, no explanation. All this is doing is breaking down our, well, our own ability to manage our own migration laws, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. You have to go back to the year 2000, when the UN and EU decided, amongst the unelected Eurocrats and the bureaucrats of the EU, and also the UN, that they decided that we needed 59 million migrants to replace our population, because we are not growing and expanding, having the children that right. we should be to replace that, and also we've got an aging population. We don't know how they came up with 59 million, but what's quite frightening is that um, they wanted to do that. So that was 2000, and by 2025, now bearing in mind we're just going into 2019, mm. where's these 59 million coming from? If you look at Africa as a whole, there are 1.4 billion people there. In, the, in Europe, there's 741 million. Mm. Now, what you could do is you could put UK, Europe, China, India, Japan and the US into Africa. We have poured billions and billions and billions of pounds into Africa to sustain their development and grow their economies. And let's face it, Africa is such a, a, a rich nation a resource, rich and resource nation. So why are we taking out their people? Yeah. You know, there is a brain drain that's inevitably going to right. come from there as well. But there's also going to be the low cost, uneducated, uncultured, yeah migrants that we're having the problems with at the moment. So 59 million, 78 million have already moved in the past few years into Europe, but that, that's sort of normal migration. So there'll be your bankers, your STEM subjects, your scientists, etc. And then what we've had to absorb in the, in the past few years is 4 million that we know of, 
We know there's another 30 million sitting there waiting to invade our countries. We know, because Frontex and, and the EU statistics tell us, there are 6.6 .6 million people sitting in camps in, in um, Egypt, Libya. Turkey's got three, three and a half million alone, and that's without those that are sitting in the camps in, in Greece and Italy. So sorry to throw all those figures at you, but I think it's important to get it into perspective yeah. of where they're all coming from right. and how they're poised to come in and how do we stop all that. So we're told that the people they're bringing in are uh, naturally beneficial. They tell us that migration is, you know, it creates prosperity, etc. Never mind the fact that we spend a great deal of time attempting to encourage people to get jobs and things like that. So the, the, the lies kind of exposed from the beginning, isn't it? Where do we stand with employment, uh, with migrants and so-called refugees coming here? Are we looking at a huge boom to our industries here or are we looking at more dependence? Oh, we're looking at more dependence because I was looking at some of the, the facts and figures. At the end of 2016, 13% of migrants have managed to find work. Across one, three. One, three, 13 percent. Um, and you would think it would be high in Germany, but it isn't. Um, the German Commissioner for Immigration, Refugees and Integration recently told the Financial Times that up to three quarters of the migrants will still be unemployed in five years. And for many others, we will need up to, up to 10. So they are a drain on resources. So every migrant that Germany has taken in, it takes 12 taxpayers to pay for that. And in Greece, you've got 50% un youth unemployment. In parts of more impoverished Greece, it's almost up to 75%. In Italy, it's, it's bordering on sort of 40% youth unemployment. So where are these jobs coming from? Okay, we're one of the more buoyant economies, mm. but we are supposed to be taking back control of our laws and right. borders, so we choose. I mean, I, I, I'm on record as saying, that I'm in the Hindustan Times and the China People's Dailies. It, we want the people that are educated that will come here and will pay for their own way, that will right. not be a drain on resources. But you're finding across the continent that these people are a drain on resources. Well, what, you know, the, the, this whole document talks regularly about human rights, mm -hmm. uh, the human rights of migrants, regardless of their migration status, uh, which I presume means, uh, correct me if, if I'm wrong, whether they're illegal migrants. No, they or don't not. can't use that language anymore. There are right. under this compact, there are no, there is no illegal mi migration. Is it irregular? It's irregular, and <laughs> that is the language they're using in the European Parliament at the right. moment. It's irregular. Everybody is a refugee. Nobody is an illegal immigrant. You cannot say illegal immigrants, and that has been stamped out in official documents. It's irregular migration. But if Okay, they're not refugees technically under their new rules, right? But they are refugees, mm -hmm. uh, or at least some of them they're are. Economic migrants. Economic Eighty migrants. percent of them are economic migrants. Right. So the argument that they are refugees is, which has been peddled for a long time. Why is it that the UK therefore has to even sign this in the first place? Because is it not true that refugees have to go to the nearest, safest country? Mm -hmm. Right. Absolutely. Does that not mean therefore that the only refugees that England would welcome are from Scotland? Ireland and France, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, I, I mean, I think we're a quite a generous country. <laughs> and, um, and, and I think the, the really sad thing about the, the, this whole debacle of, of the, the migration um, argument and, and war that we're going through at the moment is the real asylum seekers yeah. and the real refugees are not getting to, to, to our countries. Yeah. And, and because we had this sort of declaration in 2005, you are going to have 59 million. They're repackaging all of this with the language that, that you quoted. So you can't call them illegal migrants. You know, there is no such thing as, as a migrant. They're all irregular migrants. And they all have a right because it's going to be their human right. right. And that has changed. So that's fundamentally changed. But who agreed to this? Nobody asked the voters. Because then you've got to house these people. They talk about sustainable development. So we all have to pay green taxes. Mm -hmm. um, and you've got poor people and, and, and people who are elderly can't afford the green taxes in this country. Yet we're encouraging these people to come out of their homes mm -hmm. because they're on the run for climate change. <laughs> And then we're bringing them here. So who's paying right. for those houses? Who's paying for the infrastructure? You know, what, what, what are the jobs? We, we need scientists. We need mathematicians. Um, that's what we need is nuclear scientists because we're not training our own kids fast enough. We need doctors and nurses. These people are not doctors and nurses and scientists. Yeah. They're uneducated. What worries me as well is I think there's an issue that's 
largely ignored here. We talk about how unemployment is extremely low in the UK, or at least it is now, and the Tories are very proud of it. It's still around about a million. Right. Oh, exactly. It's still a huge number of people. But what's also not talked about is underemployment. There's many people Mm. that simply can't get enough hours. Uh, In fact... Zero hours contracts. Zero hours contracts, which I think, personally, I think need reforming somehow. Mm. But Mm. so many people are struggling to get even enough hours to pay the bills, to heat or eat, to look after their own children. Child poverty is such a huge problem here. And we're talking about potentially importing millions of people because, as they say, data-led, but there's no data in here. There's no cap on the amount of people that might well come here. So we're bringing in all these people. We can't provide them with jobs. We do not have the houses for them. Meanwhile, our own people, many of them are starving. Children, you know, there's, there's reports of people still uh, watering down baby milk for their children here in the UK in 21st century Britain. And we're talking about importing millions more dependents. Mm. If you look at the Somali community and the Bangladeshi communities in our country, and the Bangladeshis have been here for 30, 40, 50 years, they are underskilled, they still do not have the language skills, yeah. so they haven't integrated, and they are the one of the, the most um, abused communities because they don't speak English yeah. and they haven't been educated. And then you've got the Somalis, I think it's something like 80% unemployment amongst them. So all those people are living on our welfare, in our houses. And our schools, our infrastructure, our hospitals. But it always comes back down to Jack. Nobody asked us. Nobody yeah. asked us if we wanted to be replaced. Yeah. Nobody asked us whether we wanted our culture to be threatened. Nobody asked us whether we wanted to open our borders. Yeah. And nobody has asked us whether we wanted 59 million migrants. And bearing in mind we're at 2019, it's going to happen by 2025. If these people have, have their way. Nobody has asked us. And then they sit there scratching their heads thinking, how do we get Brexit? How do we allow Why Matteo do they Salvini? Hate us so much? Yeah, what, what, what are we doing wrong? We're decent, you know, fantastic people on fantastic salaries. We've been highly educated. But it was all those just underneath the surface are saying, no, we've had enough. You're not listening to us. Um, I don't know where it's going to go in the UK. Um, I don't know. You know, our first post to post, post, post system works for a two party state. Yeah. I don't know whether for Britain or UKIP will we'll, we'll thrive. I sincerely hope they do. So moving on to matters of cohesion and multiculturalism, which is always a big part of these things. There's a section here, 32, in the document that talks about uh, committing to foster inclusive and cohesive societies, empowering migrants to become active members of society, promoting reciprocal engagement of receiving communities and migrants in exercise of their rights and obligations towards each other, uh, observing national laws, etc., etc., minimizing disparities. Um, so this is a matter of giving away uh, resources to migrants, but it's also a matter of cohesion and I- inclusion. And when they talk about social cohesion in particular, they're not really talking about, mi- about migrants assimilating to our national culture, are they? Because they talk about stamping out xenophobia. Well, it's a, it, you know, the, the, the dirty word in the past 10 years has become multiculturalism. Yeah. You know, we know that, that that doesn't work. You, know, you and I stood in Batley and Spen, and we met women that, that arrived in our country 50 years ago from yeah. Pakistan. And when they arrived in our country, they had to speak English because they had to take their kids to school, they had to do the shopping. Yeah. And within a, a short period of time, 20 years, they didn't have to remember how to speak English yeah. because multiculturalism had taken over and they just work, li- worked and lived um, and spoke in their own communities. So I've met women that had been here for 50 years and they, they don't speak English anymore because they don't need to speak English. No. And then take another group, um, it's always vilified, is the real Roma. We've had real Roma in our country for 500 years. They've never assimilated. Hmm. Why do they expect yeah. them to assimilate? There was a Dutch study done recently that showed that, that second generation migrants um, assimilate even less they become more entrenched in their own, own cultures. And when you do import such an alien culture from Africa or from the Middle East, it, you're coming up against um, complete and utter barriers. So we're basically a Christian Judeo society and have been for thousands of years. And then suddenly you import a load of angry, uneducated right. young men. How are you going to assimilate them? It's not gonna happen, is it? And these people, you know, you, they talk about uh, xenophobia. Um, what about the xenophobia towards us? I mean, are, are we not foreign to them? Is, is our culture not foreign to them? And when they tell us that, no, we don't want to be a part of this, is that not a hate crime towards us? But in all seriousness, I think part of the problem here is when you have a, a lack of identity, of nationalism, of patriotism, when people feel it's a dirty word to be patriotic, 
Is it any wonder that when people come here, they've got absolutely no interest in what we're talking about because we pretend it doesn't exist? Mm -hmm. Oh, no, absolutely. Um, well, it's quite interesting listening to patriotism. I think M Macron spoke about it recently. It's okay to be a patriot because it was the end, it was the celebrations at the end of 100 um, years um, ago of the, fir the First World War. I was with, with Marine Le Pen in Verdun and they try and now own our language. I've seen it in the, in the European Parliament as well. Yeah. They don't call us xenophobes or racists anymore. Um, we're populists and now they're trying to reclaim we can be patriotic right. but we're not nationalists. Right. And, 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 and that's how they sort of confuse you by trying to own our own language. <laughs> if they're not nationalistic, well, it's only recently about it. we've taken back control of our flag. Yeah. You know, it isn't nationalistic to, yeah. to wrap yourself up in a Union Jack or, or an England flag. You know, we should be proud of this. The Continentals have always been proud yeah. of it. And you look, there's a resurgence of this. If you go to Poland, yeah. I mean, you were there a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, Poland, yeah. uh, fantastic. You know, they're wrapped in their, yeah. in, in their flags. They are so proud. It makes me go guzzy it looking at it. It makes me jealous. It makes me, yeah. It, it, and, you, and they wonder, and, and this is why the EU is trying to sanction them because they are nationalistic, because they are patriotic, and because they're saying to the EU, sorry, we're not taking your migrant numbers, because what they're trying to do is impose uh, migrant numbers yeah. across, across the states in the Schengen area. And they're saying, no, we're not having it anymore. And they threaten to withdraw the voting rights. And absolutely, like and take away, yes, absolutely, and take away the cash. But they are now asserting um, their their stance, and they are defending their, their culture. And both Poland and Hungary have said, we haven't had any terrorist attacks yeah. on our, our soul. And why? Because we haven't taken any migrants. And when Orban put up the, the, the borders overnight, it, well, 97%, yeah. the, 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 the invaders just disappeared. Yeah. But like Walter, they tried to find another route. And of course, they've seen it stop with Salvini again, you know, he's, he wants to make Italy great again. Mm. We, we want to make our countries great again. And we're doing that. And, and the, the supranationals hate it. They hate that language because mm. they're losing control. So Davos man, um, the UN, the EU commission, they're losing control. And there's a really good piece of uh, a good news that you can take to rebel people. You've got the May elections next year mm -hmm. in the EU Parliament. Now, the, the socialists are openly saying, we're going to lose 50% of our seats. I say, as much as 50? 50%. 50%. They're openly saying that. And are the people re replacing them nationalistic? I'm um, you'll get some hard left coming in, but oh, mainly it's us. It's the so-called populists that will be replacing them. And Merkel's EPP, you know, that enormous mm -hmm. group, and there's the socialists and, and, the, and the EPP that, that run the, the parliament you know, with their dodgy deals of um, joining up together, they, they reckon they're going to, to lose um, 50, 60 seats. So the balance of power then shifts to our side. But as someone from the inside, you know how all this works. And I'm right in saying that MEP is essentially, it's, it's, it's rubber stamping laws that come from above. You guys can't propose your own laws, right. can you? Can't amend any. Can't amend it. I mean, so it's great that all these new people are coming in. It's great that there's going to be more nationalists in the parliament, but will it change anything? It depends on the numbers. Um, I hope, I, I've long wanted, for, for years I've wanted to unite the right. Yeah. I'm not quite sure whether that's going to happen. You've got the Swedish Democrats that have moved away from UKIP to the Nordic countries now sitting in the ECR, which has the British Conservatives. Once the British Conservatives go, and they are dominate, dominant in the ECR, uh, they've got the Polish, the PIS uh, ruling party, mm -hmm. um, that's up for grabs. And you've got a lot of people that are really, not un well, really unhappy in the EPP. Is Orban going to stay in the EPP? Right. So I would hope there'll be one enormous group with Marine and Geert and, and all of us and Straka in Austria and um, Salvini with the Swedish Democrats and with the Nordic Alliance as well from the right. But I don't know. Probably there'll be two groups, but it doesn't matter. We can cooperate, or they right. can cooperate, because I, I won't be there, thankfully. <laughs> but, um, and, and then we can stop them, so that axis, once the socialists have lost that 50%, that's it, and the hard left will not deal with us. They will not vote for, for, with us, they will, well, occasionally they vote for, with us, but it's their own ideology. So yeah. if you're taking back power from the EU, or um, you're taking back control of taxes, or you're raising taxes, then they may or may not vote with us. So they'll be fractured, the extreme left will be fractured, the socialists will come back very much diminished, and then it depends on the numbers in the EPP group. So yeah, we can act, absolutely. Now we took that first brick out of the Brexit wall, and then we got the ultimate populist in charge in Trump, um, and Salvini, and Orban, and PIS. So things are changing. So. We're talking about this 
global compacts. We're talking about the crime in my book. Mm -hmm. um, the people are listening. They're not listening to these people. They're very, very angry. So that's why we've got Brexit. That's why we've got Salvini. That's why we've got Orban. That's why we've got um, the nationalists, um, patriots in, in control in um, Poland. And this may be well, and uh, is likely why this document is being pushed and signed in the first place. It's an attempt it's to wrestle finding. back control. Yeah, it's about, it is about them taking back control, yeah. wrestling back control. So we'll see where it goes, because it won't be, f uh, won't be long before that actually becomes legally binding. Yeah. But then again, we can still unpick it. What sort it. of time frame? Don't know. Don't know. Very quickly, I would have thought, because yeah. this has been rashed up over the past few months. So we'll see where it goes. You've, you've got first-hand experience of these crises, right? You've been travelling and going to the migrant camps and seeing it for yourself. So what would you say to the people that say, well... If you read this document, it's telling us, well, we want freedom uh, for people and we want them to be safe and we want them to be able to move uh, from one country to another and be safe with their families. And isn't that all very well and nice, helping refugees? What would you say based on your experience going to these migrant camps? Well, I, I think I'm the only UK politician to so frequently visited the Calais camps when it was the jungle mm. and there it's, uh, it's the, the new migrant camps. And I would say, and this is backed up by the NGOs that are in there, 90% of the people that are in the Calais camps mm. are economic migrants. They've actually told me this on, on camera. I've also had run-ins with the Red Cross as well, in Calais as well, who are telling them, they openly admit on camera, that they tell them to uh, basically destroy their documents. Right. So that um, they can claim, if they're coming from Iran, or you can claim your um, Afghan asylum seekers, or if you're from um, Afghanistan and that doesn't fit the book at the moment, then you can claim you're coming from, from Iran. And we're seeing more and more coming across, and there's more ingenious ways of getting across. Um, I, I can remember going the first time and watching the sniffer dogs on the, on the Calais side going up and down with the lorries. So I spoke to the, to the guy, they're all English, private security company that the government have employed with the dogs and this one particular dog had caught 20 that morning and her sister had caught another 20 so I said what have you done with them well we just popped them back over the wall now the last time I went I went in a Belgium registered car with my Dutch assistant with my British passport and we parked outside it was the, it's the new camp as well and the place the one after the jungle the one after the jungle which was raised i went uh, I, was, I was applying to going there and i had to show my passport i had to prove who i was and i said hold on a second i've got to show my passport as a british citizen to get into a migrant camp however the migrants are just allowed to wander <laughs> everywhere and try and break into my country so you couldn't make it up and then a couple of years ago i went to the greece i went to greece to the, to the migrant camps it was an official eu visit and there's a couple of things to take from there um, there's a guy called, uh, an, an MEP called Mr Niedermüller, who is a Romanian, no he's, an, he's a Hungarian MEP. He's quite a sort of senior socialist and he went into a room, we had, there's about 30 NGOs there to brief us on. We were from a wide political spectrum from the right to the um, extreme alt-left in there. Um, and he said, what's the message basically that um, we should deliver? As, as MEPs making these decisions and bearing in mind at that point it was, that was just when the barriers went up the, the border controls went back up in Hungary mm. and Austria and it was getting more difficult to get out of Greece so we went to the, the northern Thessaloniki um, camps which has since been raised to the ground and before we went in we were briefed by these NGOs and he said well Mr Needmuller said my message to the people in the camps is going to be don't worry We've temporarily closed the borders, but they'll be open soon and you'll be able to come in. Now, for me, I, I, I wasn't the first one to say, uh, excuse me, you don't speak on my behalf. So <laughs> I just looked at a couple of colleagues, there was a Flemish nationalist and there was the Five Star Movement. And they said, you don't speak on our behalf. And I said to the NGOs, what will happen if Mr Niedermuller goes down into that camp and delivers his messages? And he, they said there will be riots. They're already setting fire to the camps. There are riots down there at the moment. You're going to have to have security to go into these camps. So that's the irresponsible left. And th these are the people that they're trying to bring in. Th these are the people that the UN is essentially claiming needs all this support. And by the way, when they say rights, they're talking about giving them health care, all public services, absolutely ev everything. So it's also a form of theft as well, isn't it? And bringing in people who are taking from a system that we've been paying into for a very long time. And to make things worse, they're dangerous people. I mean, there are real refugees, as you said, Izzy Abibi being an obvious example. There are real people that need our help. And this UN document is just destroying any ability for us to actually facilitate um, 
people who really need, need our assistance. Oh, right? absolutely, because what they state is that um, immigration is inevitable, right. it's necessary, and it's desirable. Huh. So that, that, you know, th those are three statements in there. And if you look at what Angela Merkel has been saying about this as well, she's saying that nation states have to give up sovereignty for this document. Right. And she also states that um, if you don't sign this document, then you're nationalistic. Now, what's okay. wrong with being nationalistic <laughs> and actually caring yeah. about your country and closing your borders? So that woman learnt nothing yeah. from the 1.8 million people that she let in. And of course, you know, the consequences of this is crime. I mean, I, I wrote a book, um, The Migrant Crime Wave. You can get that for free online, right? Free online on my website, uh, janisatkinson.co.uk, um, and you can download it. And I, and I wrote this. Um, because there was such a gap in the market. Eurostat, which is the official yeah. EU um, body that produces all the, the statistics from, you know, from growth rates through to crime statistics, had not updated their crime statistics since 2015. Wow. So we had to go into the, the archives, dig behind, and then we found out a lot <laughs> of the um, crime statistics so of things, the migrants. These are the things that they've been wanting to cover up? Yeah, oh, abs absolutely. The foreword is written by Matteo Salvini, Deputy Prime Minister and good friend of uh, Europe. You know, we've been working together, him in my group, the Europe of Nations and Freedom. We are the only ones that are saying this is wrong, this cannot yeah. carry on. This is totally unsustainable. So then we started looking at some of the figures and we looked at the prison numbers um, of the EU na the foreigners that are in our, our jails. In Austria, 54% of the criminals that are in jail are foreign. In Italy, it's 34%, and as you go, go on, it's like 44% in these countries. And these countries are not countries that have ever had migration, like yeah. we've had migration you know, f forever, for yeah. centuries, and even more so since the sort of 50s and 60s. So the UK, um, actually some of our migrants are very more, more integrated yeah. than, than the, the new arrivals. Um, but the crimes that they're committing, we've got Sweden is the rape capital of the world. Mm -hmm. You know, you know what happened in Germany on the um, New Year's Eve of 2015, 16. Um, they were suppressing the rape numbers, the sexual harassment numbers of women. Um, a sorry, a thousand were recorded. We actually think it's three times that amount because of the websites that are showing where women are actually reporting this. So we're allowing these fit young men yeah. who are culturally unaligned with us, who don't understand our cultural norms and that it's okay for women to, to walk around in stockings and show a bit of cleavage, mm -hmm. it, cleavage if you want to. And it's okay if we want to get a bit tipsy on New Year's Eve, but we don't actually expect to go out and get raped and sexually right. assaulted by young men that really don't understand our cultures, but we're told to cover up instead. Right. Um, and then you see knife crime go through the roof in London at the moment. Um, but it was going- it was every, Almost every day. It's, there's 124 murders in London with knife crime and that was as of two days ago. Um, but it has been creeping up anyway. And again, in the book, we show that the majority of knife crime, vast majority of knife crime is committed by migrants. Mm -hmm. And it was Romanians actually, then followed by Nigerians, North Africans, Afghans, Somalis in particular. Um, and now there's been this exponential rise over the past year. And again, it's migrants and it is children of migrants as well. You know, we're importing the third world and we're getting third world right. problems in our country. They've only just started experiencing this over the past three years on the continent, but we're really seeing that and the rise in knife crime in, a, in our own capital city. And what's worrying is even just talking about this, criticizing mass immigration, using statistics and facts and logic and tangible evidential things, could soon become, well, essentially illegal because uh, another part of this document is that they aim to crack down on xenophobic rhetoric and they want evidence-based discussions on migration, which means migration based on their evidence and not the evidence that they tried to hide from Eurostat. Mm. They want to control what we're saying ab about migration, which is a very worrying thing because we're gonna reach a point where these terrible things are happening on the street you have to keep keep still. We're already seeing it. I mean, you look at um, the amount of, of journalists and, and other publications that have been taken down from Facebook and Twitter, yeah. and it's the conservatives that are being silenced That's in right. America, in Australia, and in my country as well. And only last month in the EU, they signed a motion declaring um, that they were going to shut down hate groups. Right. And also that means political parties as well. But what constitutes right. a hate group? 
and they talk about far right. But who then decides right. who's far right? Is that Marine Le Pen? Is that Guy Wilders? Is that the British Conservative Party because they want to close their borders? You know, it's very arbitrary. And these people are controlling this because they've got to the Mark Zuckerbergs. They've mm. got to Jack Dorsey of Twitter and they're threatening them with legislation if they don't comply. But because we've got the liberal left running the big social media giants and then in the parliament, in the EU parliament, we have, you've got the so-called right and then you've got the middle ground, which is basically controlled by Merkel and the socialists. And then yeah. you've got communists. You know, you've got Sinn Féin IRA that sit opposite and these people have an input. But nobody ever mentions about the violence yeah. from Antifa and the far left. Nobody mentions the riots of the G20 um, recently or, the, 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 or, or in Paris. Mm -hmm. you know, none of that is ever mentioned. I got thumped when we were in Prague. Uh, about a year ago when I tried to get through Antifa to get into to speak at uh, an event. But nobody talks about no. that. It's always about the so-called right. Yes, absolutely, neo-Nazism is on the rise, but you have to wonder why the so-called neo-Nazis and nasty fascists, the real fascists, yeah. actually are on the left, but you have to question why these people are on the rise, because it's exactly the reason for this document, for the UN Global Compact, and because the, U, the, the migrant crime wave, which is being suppressed and not spoken about. But when you suppress these feelings, People get angry. And when you have people living in communities, especially in working class communities, where they feel totally alienated, ignored by the political class, the communities are changing around them, you bet you're going to get Nazis. You bet. It's going to happen. So whether this is well-intentioned or not, ultimately, the goal that they're trying to reach is never going to be reached. Because for as long as they suppress even discussion about these problems, they are going to create real extremists on both the left and the right. Say Theresa May, you know, goes off to Morocco in December, waltzes in, signs away our freedom and our ability to create our own and manage our own immigration laws. Is she doing that on her own back? Has she even asked Parliament? No. So There's been no discussion. This is being taken at a supranational level of the UN. So ultimately the decision here doesn't lie with the voters, doesn't lie with the people. And, you know, we're not just changing tax pol policy slightly. I think this is such a huge change it w warrants a referendum. So the people aren't being asked in a referendum if they want their borders to be completely opened. Um, and there's a whole Parliament. mockery. There's a whole mockery of the Brexit shambles. Yeah. So if you think well, she, she, she's not now on video and she's going around the country saying we are taking back control of our laws and our borders. It's a complete and utter lie. Mm. Because although this agreement is supposed to be non-binding, we all know what happens to these. The supranational um, entities then create international law, thereby taking away the derogation of national so sovereignty. So you can see there's this sort of this supranational creep. Right. So we might be t leaving the EU eventually. Maybe. We might be taking back our borders, but we're not ultimately because we've got to open our doors to the world because so the UN says so. It's, it's non-binding, but I mean, well, what's the purpose of doing it if it's non-binding? Oh, because eventually it becomes binding or well, the people oh, haven't revolted. So the people happens, haven't realised. What happens when it does become binding? Will there be a vote? Will there be... No, because it's then into, into international law. And, it, and Britain is such a good little country, is that we abide by international Do law. Do anything they say. Um, there's a specific section that uh, references encouraging and educating media outlets, including yeah. online media outlets. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not just the BBC. Yeah. They also say that state-funded broadcasters will lose their funding yeah. if they're xenophobic. But the question is, what is xenophobia? Who's xenophobic? And who gets to decide if something's xenophobic? What if somebody goes on the BBC and says something factual about the migrant crime wave, does the BBC then lose its funding? I mean, there's so much in this to be terrified about. And I don't know, I, I like to give the politicians the benefit of the doubt sometimes, just to try and think about it from their perspective. I don't like to think everything's a grand conspiracy. So if we're going to presume that Theresa May has good intentions, she wants to sign this with good intentions, how can she possibly think that this is ever going to end well? Absolutely. And when you think about her lying about taking back control of our laws and borders, we're not. We're actually giving away our, our controls over our borders and mm. our sovereignty and our parliament. This is supposed to be about taking control back from the EU, back from the supranationals of this, this world. But no, we're just handing it over. So it's been very disingenuous. And I'm just hoping that the mainstream media will, will pick up on what we've been saying. You know, it's, it's only I'll us from... It's only us from the conservative right that's been talking about yeah. it.
What I wanted to ask you finally is, what do you think people can do about it? Well, I wrote to Theresa May a few weeks ago saying, please do not um, sign this, and these are the reasons why. And she never replies, actually. <laughs> uh, Saji Javid sometimes replies to me, uh, Home Secretary. Um, but no, there was no reply. Um, so what do people actually have to do? They have to write, right. physically write, put a stamp, write a letter, yeah. and put a stamp on it. Because MEPs, MPs get thousands and thousands of emails a day. Most of it is done by... Um, lobby groups right. so we just sort of ignore it you know save what whatever it is um so we just ignore it but if there's an important vote coming up then we do pay attention because it's uh, right. it's according to a vote but what we do find is that if somebody actually takes the effort and writes a proper letter and puts a stamp on it and what they've got to do is threaten those remain mps and also labor and conservative no matter who, who is your MP? Yeah. You have to write to them and say, this is really unfair. This is against free speech. We didn't vote for this. It's against um, taking back our laws and control of our borders. We didn't vote for this. Who on earth sanctioned this document? Yeah. And please, you've got to urge our Prime Minister, whatever side of the house you sit on, not to sign this compact. And that's the only way we can do it. There is a petition doing the rounds on change.org okay. at the moment. It's up to about 13,000. But again, I think people... Um, are so obsessed with Brexit, and quite rightly so. Yeah. You know, it is all-consuming across the media. I mean, maybe that's why this is happening now. I mean, yeah, it's certainly it's convenient it's to slip yeah, through the, the net. UK, yeah. <laughs> yeah, probably. But, you know, the, Trump's talking about it, the Israelis, Australia's talking about it, a lot of the EU countries are talking about it. But Britain is so insular in some ways um, when we're reporting sort of world news and what's acceptable to report and what isn't yeah. acceptable to report. So that's all that people can do. And I don't know when this is going to be aired, but this is going to be signed on the 10th and 11th. She might do a Gordon Brown. Do you remember Gordon Brown with the Lisbon Treaty? Oh, where naming he, it. You, you couldn't see him. You couldn't see him getting on a plane, and he, he snuck in by a back room and he signed it for the squiggle. He wouldn't have the official photograph. <laughs> and I bet you that's what May does as well. She won't be there smiling away. She'll just slip in and sign it. And then get, she's got and then get back to the, uh, the media storm about Brexit yeah. afterwards. Because she's got the vote, we think, on the 12th of December. So again, I don't think too much will happen on this because I think that the part of the voting ballot on yeah, the Brexit right. shambles is the 12th, yeah. So, so she might just sneak... Did, well, she's supposed to be campaigning in the next two weeks, you know, vote for me. It's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's a good general election with one candidate. <laughs> 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 so I think this will just slip in under the radar. But I hope not. People go out and vote and stop this. Thank you so much, Jenny. If you want to see more from me and the rest of the Rebel team, be sure to download our new app from the Apple App Store and the Google Play Store.